This is the Darshan Talks podcast, regulatory guy, irregular podcast with host Darshan Kulkarni. You can find the show on Twitter at Darshan Talks or the show's website at darshantalks.com. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Darshan Talks. We just spoke recently, but welcome on again. Um, I... I'm your host, Darshan Kulkarni. It's my mission to help patients uh, trust the products they depend on. I'm an attorney, I'm a pharmacist, and I advise companies with FDA-regulated products. So if you have an interest in an FDA-regulated company or their products, this is the podcast for you. Uh, Today's guest is the Vice President of HR Technology and Analytics at HR Computes. Uh, he uh, He has a variety of different tools he's spoken to us about. That had in the last conversation we spoke about, he actually talked about uh, applicate, applicant tracking systems, and he talked about hacking them. He talked about EEO reporting. He talked about uh, coupons, if you will. Um, he talked about ways to stay in touch. Um, he told us about Jobscan.co, which I thought was a really interesting tool that I'd never heard of before. Um, and and he talked a little bit about how those tools can even be a way for CEOs to talk to talk to employees. Um, today, he's going to talk to us about a couple of other tools that I've never even heard of, but um, but I have to be honest, they, they scare me a little bit. And then they also simultaneously go, make me go, this is really, really cool. And I can't wait to learn more about them. Um, so our guest for today, ladies and gentlemen, Morris Yankel at uh, HR Compute, uh, Computes. And thank you again, Morris, for coming on. Thank you, Darshan. A pleasure. It's always nice to talk to you. You are challenging, and uh, I love that. So let's do it. Well, I'll try to stay challenging. Good. Uh, <laughs> so, so let's start with a really basic question, Morris. So one of the things we're talking about is, um, is this idea of, and, and we spoke about it a little bit earlier, how do you, you we, we spoke about applicant tracking. How do you find those applicants? What are the tools out there? If you're small to, if you're like 50 to 100 people or more, what kind of tools are out there to go, you know what, I need those superstars because they they mean more to me mm-hmm. because everything I do is make or break for this company. Yeah. So, you know, these days, most people are using um, LinkedIn and most recruiters are using the recruiter's version of LinkedIn and it's not cheap. Um, So that means that then you're setting up searches, you're putting in criteria, you're allowing that to feed you people. Well, there are some other systems where they scrape the data from LinkedIn as well as other public and private databases, and they provide you with more tools to do that. They call it sourcing. Finding candidates, and everybody in recruiting talks about the passive candidate. You wanna steal someone else's star and you want them now to come to your firm. So the way to do that is find them and then establish a relationship with that person. And these, some of these new systems really, it's almost like they're doing marketing to you based on the kinds of things that you say to them. Very so, kind of Google-esque. So, <laughs> Google-esque. Uh, so how, how do these systems find these, these unicorns, if you will? Sure. So, I mean, they, you know, what do they call it? Spiders. And that's, you know, programs that are out there that are pulling data um, from all over the place. So when you put in an email address or you put in um, your LinkedIn profile or you have a Facebook page or you have a p- paper published on, you know, some sort of uh, life sciences website or in a journal or something like that, they're scraping that data and they're amassing these records of, frankly, Hundred, uh, I'm sorry, multiple hundreds of millions of candidates, potential candidates for every role. Uh, and then when the company puts in the criteria, I need uh, someone in dental research. I need them to have cavities, uh, caries research. I need them to be doing a, a certain, you know, experiments on animals. I want them to have uh, clinical research in their background. And I need them to come from these five schools um, and live in this Kind of geographical area you put in that criteria it's going to feed you back ranking those potential candidates based on the criteria that you put in and now you can delve deeper now you can take a look at those people 
now you can start to reach out to them. You can set up a cadence of an email marketing campaign to them. So I shoot a note to Darshan because I'm looking for a pharma, a, a pharma lawyer. Sure. Okay. And uh, Darshan clicks on one of the things and he goes to our website and he views something. Boom. Now the system knows Darshan clicked on that. So now send him this email, whereas I reached out to Morris and he didn't click on it. So give him two weeks, send him something else. Now Darshan gets that second one and he interacts with it in a certain way. It'll lead you down a path, classic, you know, marketing, yeah. um, marketing campaign, but now they're using it for candidates. But, but that really scares me, right? Because from a privacy viewpoint, the concern is that you're, you're tracking me. I didn't consent to be tracked. Does that raise privacy concerns by, by definition? Well, you didn't consent to be tracked. I would sort of disagree with you. You put your LinkedIn profile, you put your LinkedIn profile out there. Yeah. You yeah. know, you you publish this paper and it's on, you know, uh, lifesciencepapers.com. Right, um, right. You, you did an interview for Time Magazine and it's yeah. out there in the sphere, in the, in the info sphere. Um, yeah. You know, it's, yes. Is it stealing your social security number? No. No, no, but no. what it's scraping is so it's not your private and personal information you know yeah. it's, it's not although it is your email address if that's available it is potentially your phone number but you're putting that in linkedin or that is in places where you know that are public databases um so i i would argue that it is you know that we're not doing anything illegal here we're not no, going no. into your bank account we're not going in you know getting your a social security sure. number but um I, I actually watched a, a demo um, a couple times now of one of these systems, and I felt like a big brother, big sister world right. where it's really, it is collecting this data. But if we think about it, you know, somebody like Google, um, you know, or somebody like Facebook, they're doing it today, right? When you're on those uh, websites and you click on, you know, a car advertisement, well, gosh darn, if three minutes later, you're not getting a, a pop-up that has Volkswagen, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, or, or whatever. You write an email that says, you know, you, you're looking for information on restaurants. How come Yelp pops up, you know, just randomly? Come on, come on. That's yeah. So, yeah. you know, this is sort of taking it to the next step of trying to talk to someone and trying to have a relationship. Now, if that person freaks out, and kind of goes, you know, you can't just say, because you clicked on this, I'm right. sending you this email. You don't want to make it too um, yeah. intrusive. But at the same time, uh, it's it's also, it's sort of leading them down the path to understand what do you bring to that relationship. But, but in marketing uh, campaigns, you have an opt-out option. And you do. You would in these. You would, would indeed in well. these. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, yep. so let me ask you this question. So, do, do these types of systems and it sounds like there's some incredible systems to mm -hmm. find the, the unicorns that you couldn't find before but that also means that people who don't fit that traditional role someone who was who went to a top 10 school instead of a top mm -hmm. 5 school mm -hmm. someone who ranked differently but has more experience so mm -hmm. depending how you set up those criteria other people just don't get noticed so do we land up in a scenario where you create a haves and have nots just because you've taught the system to be more discerning than you probably need to be. Well, you're asking a very deep question, Darshan. And if you do not search for diverse candidates or you look in places where you are not going to find, you set the criteria, you're not gonna yeah. find diverse candidates, you will not benefit from diversity. That is right. totally true. But yeah. at the same time, you have to think that if I'm looking for someone with five years experience, I don't want to look at someone with 10 years experience or 20 or 30 years. Is that ageism? Well, one some could argue that could be ageism. On the other hand, it's also, I want someone relatively fresh out of school with only this much experience. We're going to teach them and we're going to pay them less than maybe we would someone who you know, they are making an assumption that 20 year vets not going to take that lower salary, but right. you know, that's their, what they're allowed to do that. They're allowed to set the career criteria. Now, on the other hand, 
you could search only historically black colleges. Right. So you could turn the tables on that and you could, you know, input that kind of information. You how, how often are people doing that though? I, it, it totally depends on the company, right? Right. It's right. absolutely at the whim of the organization. Now, if you're an organization though, that is really striving for diversity, equity, and inclusion, then you're gonna do that. I mean, I see a lot um, now where people are, you know, they're looking for that diverse talent. So they are looking in places where that diverse talent, you know, potentially is. Um, it's, it, I think it's interesting where this sort of, it's not really AI. I mean, it from collecting the data, sure. it's AI. But really what you're doing, you're setting up a basic search that says, here's the criteria that I believe I need. Now, if I start that kind of a campaign and I don't get any good candidates, then potentially I'm gonna change my criteria. Or if I look at the demographics within my organization and I find you know, that I have all uh, whatever green people and I want some blue people, then you know, I can change that criteria in certain ways. Now, there, these systems are not saying, let me only search for blue people. It's not you know, to that level. It let me only see male or female or whatever kind of candidates. It's searching based on the characteristics of the human. And those characteristics, you know, they do sort of, in many cases, they will um, specify. Now, the other piece is, though, Darshan, um, and, and it's interesting to me, there's a couple of organizations I've heard recently, again, diversity, equity, inclusion, where they are doing things, um, bringing in people who are not qualified, but bringing them in almost as interns and bringing them in really to give them a leg up to, you know, start to help. Uh, whatever civilization to start to help and to do things and those people are you know becoming valuable and and great uh internal employees but that is a situation that is based on the company what do they want to do in this case i think your your question originally from a life sciences perspective if you have 50 or 100 employees if you go to an uh, a headhunter you know, a placement agency. They don't like it when you call them headhunters. Uh, if you go to a placement agency and you have someone um, search and find you a candidate, quite often it's uh, 25% or more of the first year salary right. for that hire. Right. Um, that's a lot of money. It can be a lot of money. Absolutely. These systems, some of these systems are co cost less than that amount of money. So, it, even just giving it a try. Or the other thing is if you have a higher volume that you're looking for, if you increase your volume of, you know, candidates to hire, well, hires to candidates, is so that you're not slogging through tons of candidates, that you are hiring better or more frequently or in a shorter amount of time, the amount of money that you save can easily be quantified to show that, you know, you're doing a better job at recruiting. So, so you talk about these tools that can scan the, the ether, and I, I sort of went onto LinkedIn and I consented for my data to be on LinkedIn. Um, and you talk about the, the value of that because it makes the company's life easier. They're, most companies don't exist to, to make the world better. However, <laughs> that, that may be, well, the, in, in the sense that they did ideally like that to happen, they're not against it, but they're trying to solve a specific problem. That's why they got into the world. Uh, the, the, the part that I'm asking is do, once, once they found that unicorn, how do, how does one use that opportunity to make sure the unicorn stays and are there sure. technological ways to make sure that happens or, or uh, we'll, we'll address a different version of that same question. You found that diverse candidate who, uh, who probably should have been there first place, but your criteria were too um, discriminating. Well, I don't want to use the term discriminating. Too, but too focused, too close. Limit limiting, there you go. Limited. Too focused, too, too limiting. Mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how do you make sure that once they're in, they don't leave? Mm -hmm. So what, what tools do we have sure. for that? So, you know, the best way is, right, treat them like a mushroom, put them in the dark and, and feed them poo. No. <laughs> That's not the best way, Darshan. What? The best way is to treat them like a human being. And generally, human beings like to have their opinion asked for. 
um, have potentially a mentor, have someone who's interested in them and interested in their ideas, who's going to include them, that we see constantly, those are the highest engaged employees. Those are then the most productive companies and the most profitable companies. So nowadays there are some really interesting tools that, for example, uh, take a look at the emails that you're sending to each other, or even take a look at and record the conversation that you're having with them, or the texts that you're doing with that person. I should go texts that you're doing with that person. Take a look at those words and evaluate them from a sentiment analysis perspective. You know, hey, this person sounds guarded, or this person's feeling intimidated, or, you know, why did you ask those kinds of questions? And almost nudge, I'm sorry, Darsha. No, no, so let, let me ask that question, but because uh, you're, you're gonna explain how the process works. But mm -hmm. before we do that, how do you know the process works at all? And what I mean by that is sentiment analysis. This person seems upset. Well, yeah. Am I, and, and, or is it just, I was upset with that person or I was upset with uh, something else is going on in my life. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you're paying for my cell phone plan, maybe I'm okay with you looking at it. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I think of my cell phone as my personal conversations and I'm not expecting you to have been monitoring my, my messages on there anyways. So how do we know that it works and are there privacy concerns there? Not legally speaking, but sure. ethically speaking or managing sure. and talking to your employees kind of that kind of conversation. Sure. So that, how do you know they work um, basically is that, you know, the vendors will tell you they have um, vetted these kinds of algorithms out and they show you examples where, you know, somebody says, "Woo, that's really bad means that's really actually good as opposed to that's really bad and it's negative. So I think, you know, that is a little bit of you have to kind of believe it. Um, but they are showing you empirical science to show that this is something that people are doing and that uh, or computers are doing and that it is very accurate. Um, and then you also have to remember that you're going to see the context of the conversation with these overlay with this overlay of what is the sentiment that's going on and what could be going on. It's it's things to show to you as a manager to highlight to you to ask more questions to engage the employee in more conversation. It's not just, you know, whoa, he thinks something's bad, you know, and let's overreact. It's, hey, you know, yeah, we were talking the other day and you mentioned that you thought that was really bad. Well, is that, how come it's bad? And the person, you know, then says, whoa, it's so bad it was cool, you know, or I'm, I'm talking like I'm a hippie here. Right, right, but right. I think that's, you know, it's it's the vernacular versus uh, urban, urban dictionary, right? But sure. yeah, I think that's, you know, that's the thing. This is not, and it's just like AI, right? If if AI says to you, this is the best candidate, you take it with a grain of salt and you look deeper. You're not just going, find, hire them, click. You're then bringing them in and you're doing an interview. In this case, what you're trying to do is manage that employee. And this is just another tool in the toolbox to enable you to do it. Even for that toolbox to say to you, you know, hey, maybe this person needs some um, supervisory training or maybe they need uh, you know, better ways to communicate training. Um, and here are some ideas. And you know, it enables the manager to sort of click those and send them over and say, you, know, you might wanna take a look at some of this stuff. I took this class and it was great for ABC project management, or even in the conversation, the person says to them, boy, I'd really like to get some more training on project management. This thing is backing that manager up to be able to say, hey, Here's some classes, take a look at them. Here's some things, you know, free or whatever, internet, those kinds of pieces. So it's another um, it's another tool in the toolbox for that kind of uh, interaction. So is, is the, I guess now I'm thinking, speaking like a lawyer, but- You are. <laughs> so I've heard, so I've heard. Someone's told me yeah. that before. Uh, <laughs> but like, I guess my question is in those scenarios where you have the ability to, to monitor people's behavior, um, is there a risk now that I didn't, I, I saw the behavior, I didn't report it. Do you see companies having to create policies now 
on the appropriate and inappropriate use of these technologies? Or are companies going, this is just a tool we have, we're not taking on additional liability for it, we're just trying to hopefully use it if we need to. So a couple things there, I think. Before you had said, you know, is, is there some uh, privacy concern? And I think the privacy concern is around lack of transparency. So when the conversation is, you know, here's how we're going to do this management. This is the way that we at uh, HR Computes help our employees. We take the things that we're doing, the texts that you and I send to each other, the emails we send to each other, even the phone conversations that we have, or when we sit down and we do a one-on-one -on -one like this, you tell the person, I'm gonna record this so I can watch it later so that I can gain more insight. If you're upfront about it, then you're having that communication about it. And, you know, the idea is that if it helps the employee, uh, it, it's, it's a positive. Now, on the other hand, someone like President Nixon, you know, didn't necessarily tell people he was recording them, um, you know, uh, but those conversations did go on in the Oval Office. And, um, you know, I would really like to hear the conversation between uh, Elvis Presley and Richard Nixon. They met on a number of times, a number of times. Oh, it's a classic life uh, magazine picture. Anyway, you, you took me right down the rabbit hole. But, you know, I think that's it. It's it's around being upfront with people and treating people the same. If you're doing this across the board in a department, if you're a manager doing it with all your people, you know, then there's positive out of it. And if you explain to them how you're using the tool and you're transparent about the kind of feedback that you can get, then I think it's, it's just a matter of being above board. But, but do I really have the ability to say no? Well, potentially not. I mean, you know, so quite how honestly. how transparent is it if I'm telling you, I will be beating you up. I'm being very transparent about the fact that I'll be beating you up. Do you consent while I've got you tied up? <laughs> um, I think I might quit that job, Darshan. But and I guess the person, that's the question. The do person is, choice? yeah. Well, they, they certainly have a choice to quit. I mean, you know. If if that if you're beating me up, I probably am quitting. Uh, and so you know, yes, if you're telling them up front, if you're explaining to them the types of tools, a lot of times this is perceived as a positive. Um, it's funny. I was on a Zoom call today, and the people on the call, I noticed that the three people from this company, they they did not show themselves on the Zoom call. And I kind of said, is it a company policy that you guys don't, you know, allow yourselves, you don't want to be seen on the Zoom call? And they said, oh, no, it's not. It's um, actually we find that people of a certain age and above show themselves. But those of us on the call, we're younger and we don't show ourselves. I, I never I've heard, never that, heard before. that before. I know it was just but it's it's again, it's you know, they're they're just sort of Absolutely. deciding. But it, sorry, it, it's about being upfront with someone. And the point is, what I was trying to say there is that potentially, if you tell people, even as they're a candidate, that we utilize these kinds of things to have a conversation with you, that is intended to be a positive, and many people would think so. If you're not interested in that, you probably are not gonna join that company. So again, I think it's a little bit of that. Um, plus, if they start to see positives out of it. So yeah. the one the thing that comes to mind for me that uh, I remember um, having rolled out performance evaluation process. Yeah. And in the process, you uh, often counsel a manager, you know, don't put something stupid like racist or yeah. sexist yeah. in the evaluation. And don't yeah. call someone stupid. You know, don't right. say that kind of thing in there um, or fat or bald or whatever. You know, it's, you know, yeah. talk about their performance, talk about because those kinds of things in those kinds of documents are um, legally uh, reviewable. So yeah. if it's a formal document in that case, in this case, you know, the conversations that you're having with the person, you're really sort of covering your butt that you had this conversation. And then even more so, you're utilizing it to try and help that individual. If you're utilizing it to try and, you know, pigeonhole someone or try and pick you know, then this is not a positive employee relationship. If you're tying me up, Darshan, you know, then I, I, I think, you know, it's not in my job description. So, right, um, right. You know, but, but I, I guess that takes it to the next question, right? How 
are these in real time? Are these analyses happening in real time? Um, they can happen in real time. I think the catch to it, though, is like if we were having this conversation and there's a chat over here that's yeah. constantly streaming, I'm not going to be able to concentrate on you and giving you the depth and breadth of this, you know, uh, trying to answer and trying to pivot. So it is something that the manager would look at after the conversation in most cases. Yeah. I, I guess what I was wondering is, is this a scenario where I can be doing an interview and I really want this candidate and I can get a sentiment analysis going, going, he's not happy anymore. You need to change the tone. And he's happy, but you're sounding a little irritable or, and, and sort of you adjusting to provide a, um, yeah. to be better. But the result of it is so just, just that oversight, which you may not necessarily want. How does that play itself out is what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, that's a cool thought. Uh, I, and you know what? It can evaluate that quickly. So yeah. you could get those kinds of insights. I have not actually heard of someone using it during an interview. Okay. Um, but it's kind of like the earbud, right? And yeah. your producer saying to you, Darshan, you're hunched over, you know? Yeah, right? Exactly. I mean, it's exactly. almost like that. Um, so I, I would believe it could do that. Now, whether someone is going to want that level of input, um, you know, I, I don't know, but uh, I have not heard of an interview thing that's doing that. Now, what I have heard of is the interview technology where uh, it sends an invitation to someone and basically they can record their interview anytime they want, right? So it doesn't have to be, it's a one-on-one -on -one interview because I recorded the questions. So yeah. boom, I come up on a screen and this thing and now, you know, Darshan answers the questions whenever he wants. And that kind of a system can give a transcript of that interview. It can then, you know, utilize that transcript to do this kind of kind of coaching um, or, or like you said, personality evaluation. You know, is this person positive? Are they, uh, you know, are they whatever, combative or something? Yeah. But again, people are generally on their best behavior in an interview. But let, let's free, reframe that question instead of, let's say, it being a job interview, which would be great by itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine doing that during a sales call mm -hmm. and, and doing analysis of this potential customer yep. seems happy. And now I want to, I want to leverage that or this person, you're losing this person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I didn't know if these tools can work that quickly. Um, yes. They can. So they can. So I yes. wonder why people aren't using it. Well, I think in the case of salespeople, <laughs> they're overconfident and they believe <laughs> that they can, I mean, at a certain level, these things yeah. are not reading somebody's mind, you know, yeah, they're, they're drawing inference from the words and the, the placement of the words and, you know, those kinds of things. So yeah. uh, if, if somebody is not interested, I think a lot of times a salesperson can Definitely. just tell. Um, right. But, you know, I, I think these are, these are ways that the thing that's exciting to me about it is that it's taking into consideration things that the manager, maybe they're not a good manager. And so yeah. they're not thinking of it and they're ta it's taking into consideration things that that employee is going to benefit from in a way that makes it easy for the manager to do. So that's really a powerful, you know, new tool. That's really something. And it doesn't have to be, I know we're talking human resources and technology, you know, a lot of these tools are not um, necessarily one of the large uh, HCM vendors. So yes, those HCM vendors may have these kinds of tools, but at the same time, a smaller organization can find these. You and I were talking about HR technology being in the wild, wild west again. Yeah. HR tech started with a lot of upstart, you know, kind of uh, companies that were when PCs first came out, right? And I know we're going back in time, but PCs came out and, you know, everybody paid on the mainframe payroll systems, they were all on, you know, big hardware, big stuff. So then PCs came out and these little proliferations of applicant track, what was an applicant tracking system? Nobody ever heard of that. Suddenly it's on the PC and then the internet just exploded it further. So these are small companies, PE money is being spent, HR technology bud, um, uh, business is exploding. And these kinds of companies are out there to, you know, take a look at try it for a year, try it, pilot it in a smaller area of your organization and see what you think about it. Um, they're cheap enough to be able to do some of that stuff. And, you know, they're supposed to be intuitive. 
uh, it does take time to learn how to use it and to get the nuance. And, you, you know, uh, a lot of that is where we help companies, HR computes. Um, so we don't sell software, but we help make it work for human resources or for management. Um, but these are out there, these tools. So, so here's my question. When you're doing these uh, live analyses in sentiment tracking, if you will, mm -hmm. is it based on the words or is it based on body posture or is it based on tone? Is it based on face face sort of positioning, if you will? What is it based on? Sure. Well, the ones that I've seen the most are based on words. And it's okay. not just individual words, it's groups of words, it's, you know, the syntax of how you're saying things, that's how it gets I'm bad and I'm bad, you know, um, how it yeah. understands that. But yeah. I mean, facial recognition, um, I was talking to someone earlier today and they said that uh, this background check company or, or certainly the federal government or, you know, yeah. police, comp police uh, agencies there, how did they find out who the people were who went to Washington and, you know, marched on the Capitol? Right. Facial recognition, comparing to Facebook, comparing to right. LinkedIn, comparing everywhere. So um, I have not, and, and I know that there are uh, studies and things in place where it's reading your facial expression and then trying to translate that into your mood or That's what I was you know, okay. th those kinds of things. That, that, that exists. I have not seen that yet okay. in human okay. resources technology. You know, we're HR technology is like cool, but we're not saving the world. You know, it's it's we're not quite we're not arresting people yet. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think that technology is being used in those areas. But I think it's coming. I think those kinds of Very things are, are going to be there. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're kind of running out of time. What sure. is one question you'd like to ask our audience to answer for us in the comments? Well, I mean, to me, it's where are you at with HR technology? Have you kind of seen these kinds of things? Are you interested in these kinds of things? Um, I think HR, uh, technology can do amazing things and people need help. Um, the pandemic really kind of smashed into a lot of people. And I think that companies with remote work, I think is very interesting. Um, yeah. And so does something like this sound interesting to them or... You know, how are people really using HR technology? That's something that I would be interested to hear from people. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, during our conversation, Morris, we land up talking about uh, employee coaching. We land up talking about a little bit about employee onboarding, but really getting into sourcing and, can and candidate management. We talked a lot about email evaluation and sentiment analysis. Um, we didn't really get into training classes, which is one of the conversations we, we'd hope to have. But we talked about the value of, of privacy and comparing that to transparency mm. um, and looking at the accuracy of the sentiment analysis um, and, and the limitations of it as, as it exists, but what it might do in the future. Did I miss anything? No, I like it. <laughs> okay. Good job. Uh, nothing in this podcast should be construed as legal or clinical advice of any kind. It's intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. Uh, for those of you who missed it, Morris, where can they find you? Morris at hrcomputes.com. Perfect. And if you like this podcast, please leave a comment and, and subscribe. You can find me on Darshan Talks on Twitter, or you can find me at our website at darshantalks.com. Thanks again, guys. Yeah, Darshan again, rocks. Guys. That's the one. Darshan <laughs> rocks. Thank you, man. Darshan Thank you. Talks. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. This is the Darshan Talks podcast. Regulatory guy, irregular podcast with host Darshan Kulkarni. You can find the show on Twitter at Darshan Talks or the show's website at darshantalks.com.